Hello, and thank you for joining us. Today, we will be speaking with Francie Malloy, MP. Francie has been a Republican activist since the Civil Rights Campaign 50 years ago. He is one of Sinn Féin's longest serving elected representatives, having first been elected onto Dungannon District Council in 1985 for the Torrent area. He served as an assembly member for Mid-Ulster, as well as deputy speaker in the assembly. He was elected to Westminster as the MP for Mid-Ulster in 2013 as a member of Sinn Féin, which has been a consistent supporter of the Kurdish struggle for more than 30 years. Francie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. So to begin, uh, the partition of Ireland uh, was imposed by the British government, uh, the Government of Ireland Act in 1920, and then enforced in 1921. Two years later, in another part of the world, we have the Treaty of Lausanne, partitioning the Kurdish lands and people between Iraq, Syria, Iran, and Turkey. Uh, what parallels, if any, do you see between these two acts and between the Kurdish struggle and that of Irish republicanism? Well, both the, the first thing is that the, uh, the whole issue of uh, partition and uh, the dividing up of a country has been the key factor of the British Empire uh, over the years. Uh, they've done it and the facts but have been felt around the world in nearly every country that the British ever had a hand in or their associates had a hand in. And so the, there's a great similarity. The, in 1918, the people of Ireland decided in a Westminster election that they wanted independence uh, and they wanted to have a separate state. And the Sinn Féin MPs who stood that time stood that if they got elected, they wouldn't take their seats in Westminster. They would set up the first doll, the first Irish parliament. And they done that. Uh, and set up the parliament. 75% of the, the parliament was, was Sinn Féin members uh, across the island of Ireland. This was uh, pre-partition, uh, so across the island of Ireland. But the British government ignored that completely uh, and then proceeded to set up a northern state to work with the, the unionists to threaten that the uh, like one of Churchill's lines was that the Ulster would fight or Ulster would be right. Uh, so they, he was encouraging rebellion within unionism against the British state. Uh, and, and so then they went along with that and, and they basically um, set up the partition state with, um, with the first dog and set up and then the treaty uh, and the, uh, the northern state then set up well, in the six counties of Ireland, totally against the will of the people who voted in the election. So they talk about democracy and they talk about having the vote and people having their say and participate in democracy. Uh, Sinn Féin have done all that, uh, and then we we had the the uh, Methuen Treaty, and the uh, again that divided the people of Ireland. They they got some to go with the treaty and some against it, uh, and uh, some thought that this was the best they could get at the time, uh, and so they, they fell for the they fell for the threat. Uh, Michael Collins particularly fell for the threat from the British government and the British Prime Minister that there would be a terrible war if they didn't accept the treaty. So having not accepted democracy, they then imposed the treaty under the threat of violence and, and terrible war that would actually happen afterwards. Um, so those are the, are the things that actually happened. And unfortunately, you know, around the world, the British government done the same thing. We see it with the, your own countries, with the Kurds, we see it with the Palestinians, we see it in different parts of the world where they, uh, they joined with others to partition in order to weaken and to take away the, the power, uh, and to put one state against the other to, div to divide the people. Yeah, uh, a divide and, and rule policy. Yeah. So divide and rule and yeah. divide and conquer yeah. really was what they, what they were like all along. And so, unfortunately, we're still living with the fact that Ireland was probably the first uh, country within the empire to try to break away. Mm. And as Britain said at the time, it would be the last to get its independence because it led that rebellion. Um, and I think even today, you know, the people of Ireland are still very supportive of nations who are trying to get their independence and freedom. They have the right to self-determination. Kurdish people have a right to self-determination and we support that right. Uh, and I, I think whenever you, you see around the world, the, uh, those who fought against imperialism and against the, uh, the conquering powers, they, uh, they're still divided and they have fought wars to divide them even further. 
unfortunately, and, and that's where we are today. Isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so to, to come to more contemporary times, uh, the British government now seems almost intent on, on jeopardizing the terms of the Good Friday Agreement in order to, or in the process of separating Britain from Europe, both in terms of trade and the judiciary. Um, its priority is detaching itself from EU regulations, even at the expense of maintaining the integrity of the United Kingdom. So first, how is this seen by the loyalist population in Northern Ireland? And then what, in your view, are the opportunities uh, in these circumstances for republicanism and the prospect of a united Ireland? Well, I think there's two things. As an Irish Republican, I want to see a united Ireland. Uh, and uh, the breakup of the, of the Commonwealth, the Union, is all part of what we want to see. Uh, right. The United Kingdom, as they call it, is not a united kingdom. It's a forced the United Kingdom and was against the will of the people who acted on that. So we are, are focused on you know, getting the, the North the right to a referendum, as said in the Good Friday Agreement. Um, the British government would try to break away from that um, and, and you know, question the whole issue about the majority uh, decision. The, the, the Good Friday Agreement says that 50% plus one will be the deciding factor, which is democracy. Uh, it was good enough for the Brexit, uh, so there is no reason why it should change. We would like to see more in support of United Ireland. We'd like to see more unionism coming on board for United Ireland. But hopefully that will happen. And that depends on the British government working with the people and becoming a, a facilitator of that, not being as both the unionist, uh, the, the Conservative Party leader and the, uh, the Secretary of State, and now we find the Labour Party also saying that they're unionists and they would be fighting against the breakup of the union. So that's against the will of the Good Friday Agreement. The Good Friday Agreement was a, a lifeline to nationalism and to republicanism. It gave them an alternative pathway to conflict, a, a means of actually creating a United Ireland by peaceful means and by a democratic vote. And they need to be given that democratic vote in order to, to have the opportunity to have their say in a new Ireland. It's a hundred years since partition, and the uh, that's too long. The uh, so we do need to have now the right to have a political view and a political say in the future of the country, north and south. Mm -hmm. And uh, in in the in this Brexit process, do you think that the the British government uh, would have had to? Um, initiate or maintain a free trade agreement with the European Union to maintain the unity of these four parts of the United Kingdom, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland? Well, they could have had that. And, and we found that, you know, well, Theresa May and DUP pulling her out of the meeting uh, and, and objecting to the agreements that they were setting up that time, mm -hmm. uh, or whether it was with Boris Johnson, who actually used the DUP uh, to prop up his government, until he had a majority, and then as soon as he got that, he dumped them. Mm -hmm. uh, and this has been the history of unionism in the North. They've always been used by successive governments, uh, usually conservative, but sometimes Labour, to prop them up for a period of time with false promises. Uh, and then they, they pulled the pen away. If they wanted to maintain them, they should have kept the whole lot within the European Union. The people of the North were taken out of the European Union against their will. Mm -hmm. so the, majority of people in the North voted to remain, 56% voted to remain. If you take it down to constituencies, 11 out of the 18 constituencies voted to remain in the European Union. So that was against the will. Now, they say it was part of the what they call the UK uh, and that it was uh, an overall vote. But the people in the North uh, voted to remain, and that included a sizable number of unionists who voted to remain within the European Union. And the only way that any of us are going to be back within the European Union is because of the uh, a border poll and, and the people actually deciding for United Ireland. And the European Union has already said that if that were to happen, that they will recognise all of Ireland within the European Union. There will be no new negotiations. You know, what would happen in Germany, uh, 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 that won't happen. It will be a straightforward case that all of Ireland would be within the European and I would say it would be encouraged within the European Union as well. Mm. So whatever short-term mechanism they may bring up with the uh, protocol uh, and process, they, they have to approve the protocol 
in order to bring it to the test, uh, or they have to uh, try and actually work with the European Union to have the best of what they actually see as both worlds. But the reality on the ground here is, you know, we, we don't have the, the problems that they actually maintain. They, what we have is an attempt to use protocol or opposition to protocol in order to actually whip up the hysteria, which is really against the uh, United Ireland more than against protocol. Mm. And, and so to stay on this topic of the, the impact of Brexit, uh, I want to ask next about uh, around food and, and supplies. Um, we hear things like Marks and Spencer saying that uh, some produce will not be available in shops in Northern Ireland or that others will go up in price. So can you say a bit about what's happening on the ground regarding uh, food and, and supplies in places like Belfast, Derry and other communities in, in, north, in the north of Ireland? Yeah, well, there's, there's no sign of shortages on the, on the shelves. Uh, and Ireland is a, a self-producing country. Mm. Uh, and if the, uh, the north traded directly with the uh, north and south, then there's certainly no shortage. The Ireland is exporting out of Ireland food. Uh, it goes back to sometimes the uh, reminiscence of the famine, famine days when food was going out of Ireland and the people were left starving. But there's nobody starving in Ireland. Mm. Uh, and the lack of Marks and Spencers or Sainsbury's or any of them ones that are coming into this country, we actually don't need them. The, uh, we can produce enough. We were talking about the, the sausage and bacon war. We, we produce as much sausages in Ireland as we need, mm. and we're exporting them. So the, uh, it's, it's not a problem in this and that. The, I seen a program on television the other night where they're showing the shortages in London that actually won't reach in the shelves. So no, it's not the Irish protocol that's causing the problems. It's their trading relationship with Europe yeah. that they actually need to get right. But they're going to, again, use the orange card. Uh, the same way as the British done in 1914 against Home Rule, they're using the orange card of shortage of food and the protocol on the Irish the border in the Irish Sea, it's their border. It was a British border. They, uh, and, and they created, they negotiated it. And, and they knew what they're negotiating. So, you know, it, it is, we want to see businesses uh, operating. Already we're seeing price hikes, but it's with the lack of steel and manufacturing for timber products. Uh, timber products coming in from America, steel coming in from China. Uh, we're seeing a shortage of those and a 30% hike on the price of those. Uh, and my own constituency here of Mid Ulster is very much an engineering constituency. Uh, most of the industry here, most of it has started because of discrimination and because of the lack of jobs. The government didn't provide any jobs west of the van, which is uh, the west of the, the north of Ireland here. And the, uh, they didn't provide any jobs. So the people themselves, through unemployment, created their own industry. And some of those industries have been sold on to bigger companies like Turex and others now. But very much self-maintaining mm -hmm. and and what they're now finding is the difficulty that they can't get the steel in uh, from from china from Auburn because of brexit you know so in a sense those who voted for uh, in the conservative party for to have a hard brexit and like they weren't satisfied with a, a brexit and, and a trading arrangements those who voted for that are now the people who are uh, in industry and engineering in particular are being hit hardest because of the dup stance here in the north, which wasn't representative of the people. As I say, the people voted against leaving Europe. Uh, they voted to remain, but the DUP insisted on arguing with the British government for a hard Brexit, and that's what we finish up with. Mm -hmm. And how how serious, in your view, are these uh, latest loyalist threats we are seeing, and 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 what uh, possibility? Um, uh, do they represent for impacting both the British and Irish governments? Well, I think, you know, the, the DUP don't speak for the majority of people in the North. That's the one thing. Right. We now find that right across the North, in every constituency, there is no longer a unionist majority. Mm. And the whole basis of setting up partition and, you know, um, British control in the North was about protecting the unionist or Protestant majority, whichever way you want to term it. Uh, no, there is no longer a unionist majority. Uh, in any constituency right across the north. There's no one in, in west of the ban as they, as they try to maintain it. it. It's all Republican, the nationals. The MPs, the majority of the MPs are nationals. They, uh, so there's no longer a unionist majority and the DUP don't speak for the people, even for their own people. And we see, you know, this last while, the uh, fragmentation of the DUP as what happened with the 
Ulster Unionist before that, uh, Jeffrey Donaldson, who left the, the Ulster Unionist over the Good Friday Agreement, is now leading the DUP uh, and walking the Good Friday Agreement and, and being, you know, going to be First Minister. Uh, a bit ironic in the sense of, and, and you know, people who actually wouldn't touch the Good Friday Agreement with a barge pole are now actually uh, openly walking with it and, and trying to make it. A, so the uh, unionism is very much uh, trying to whip up loyalism to to make their case and to create the balance in the state. It's interesting that even the new DUP leaders have been uh, highlighting the fact that balance was, had returned to the streets as more or less on the lines of this is back to the troubles. But it's young loyalists who are whipping up the trouble on the street. And once they got the opportunity with a... Uh, Philip's death, we actually found that they very quickly left the streets and didn't come back onto it again. Uh, so whenever that happened, uh, we saw really what the nature of it was, was trying to flip it up. And that's the same history, repeating itself time and time again. Mm. Done it in 1914, they've done it in 1920 with the treaty, and now they're doing it again. That every time there looks to be that nationalists are going to make gains, that the United Ireland may be on the horizon, then they whip up the balance. And the only people who, who are hurt by it are young nationalists walking on the streets and being murdered, uh, as it happened so many times, or the army brought back onto the streets to quell this, an excuse for quelling it, in the same way as they tried to, to use the COVID of bringing the army back in here to open hospitals when you know, they didn't need them, but they wanted to get the army very much because they feel confident in the British army. There's an old saying within the older people was that loyalism and unionism would fight to the last British soldier. They weren't going to fight themselves, but they would fight to the last British soldier in a sense. You know? And, and that remains part of the idea today, is that if we, they can whip up the balance, then they get the reaction on the streets. But you know, we met with, with the uh, Labour leadership there recently, and we said, this is a false uh, agenda here. Th this has not been because of the people are unrest with the people. This is young thugs being put out onto the street to try and create the image of burning vehicles and burning houses. And unfortunately, as I say, whenever that happened before, what happened was Catholic houses were burned down and, and nationalists were driven in off the streets or into internment in that situation. Yeah. And you, you mentioned uh, briefly the fragmentation of the DUP that we're seeing now. Can you elaborate a bit on this? Like we recently saw the recent removal of two DUP leaders. Can you talk about some of these divisions and why it's happening? Yeah, it's strange actually, but you know, Terence O'Neill, who was claimed to be the moderate leader of unionism one time, uh, went on television and said Ulster was at a crossroads. Mm. Uh, and we very much find now that Ulster is at the crossroads again. Unionism is at the crossroads uh, and they don't know the one thing is nationalists can stand on the street and fight uh, against the British forces. Unionism can't fight against its own forces mm. because it's a contradiction. Mm. The, uh, if, if they fight against the police, if they fight against the, uh, the British forces, then why are the British forces here? Who are they protecting? What are they for? Mm. Uh, so th it's a different scenario. And unionism now finds that it, it hasn't got the political power to maintain the union. Mm. It hasn't got, if it went to a vote, they, they would, wouldn't have a majority in the Assembly of the Premier. They, if they keep in the present form, most likely Sinn Féin would be the First Minister in, in the Assembly. Uh, and if things progress the way they are in the South, then Sinn Féin could be in government North and South at the same time. Uh, and, and that you know, highlights the fact that, that there's no longer a need or reason or an excuse for a partition or for a separate state. Uh, it, it is time to then look for the border poll and, and to decide that. But unionism is in a very difficult position for itself at the moment because they've, they've changed their leader because the leader wasn't hard enough and wasn't uh, strong enough. Uh, and then they found the next leader only lasted a few weeks uh, and, and was thrown out again because union didn't like the road that he was going down. Like it's interesting that he went to Dublin to visit the tea shop one day and the next day he was thrown out of office. Uh, and he, he still has his first minister in place which was all he gained out of that whole uh, debacle. But the, the problem is that the unions doesn't know where to go. They're, they're like a lost tribe mm -hmm. again. Uh, but what their role is and should be is with building an all-Ireland structure. 
within on all islands structure unionism would be a very strong voice for the future could be in a coalition government in the in the whole of ireland could be you know, could retain the assembly uh, for uh, as a transition period but unionism needs to start to negotiate its management of the future because the management is there uh, if, and we're open everyone north and south is open to unionism in part and partial of that we want to build a new Ireland, not to, mm -hmm. to simply bring on six counties into the 26 counties, but a new Ireland which mm -hmm. has a new constitution which deals with and recognises unionism as an important part that they have to play in the future of Ireland. And unfortunately, they didn't take that opportunity last time, and hopefully they don't miss it this time, because things are going to happen. Change is going to happen anyway. We're going to have the United Ireland. We're going to have the referendum on that United Ireland, and we will have an All Ireland government, which most likely Sinn Fein will be part of. And we want unionism to play its part in the management of that change to bring about a democratic process. Mm. And so, if we go back historically, uh, the partition of Ireland secured a, a, a relative kind of economic and social privilege for the unionist population in the north, which is related to England's colonial approach to Ireland. And in recent years, have, have in your view, has this privilege been been undermined? Uh, and if so, why and in, in what way? Or have we seen it receding in some way? Well, I think, first of all, partition failed. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take it back whenever partition was brought in, Belfast and the North was the whole basis of industry and the economy was booming. Uh, Dublin was second fiddle to that. Now we see the real total reversal of that there. Uh, the Irish government going into Europe uh, and becoming a strong player within Europe. Uh, and the industry in the north, the shipyard, which the entire north was based around, and which was a sectarian headcount as well. So Protestants got jobs automatically in the shipyard, not because of their education or their skills, but because they were Protestants. They, uh, and, and so they automatically walked it. And that was a failure because they didn't have to then try or strive for to get education or resources. And so partition uh, has brought about all of that there. And, and partition failed the North as well, because mm -hmm. it, it meant that the North, as, as probably was envisaged at the time, that it would transfer and would change and would progress in an all-Ireland dimension. But it didn't happen because the North just felt that they had the power themselves and they could just sit there and use it and abuse it. And so we led to the civil rights campaign then looking for very basic demands of you know, a vote, the right to vote, the right to a house and the right to a job. And mm -hmm. the fact that the Northern state unionism couldn't deliver that or wouldn't deliver that, and the British government didn't force them to deliver that, meant that the, the state fell apart. Because one thing that the Northern state couldn't deal with was equality or justice. Mm -hmm. uh, it was based on, on enforced uh, by the uh, force of arms, uh, in discrimination, uh, in gerrymandering of the constituencies, everything that was wrong like about an apartheid the system. Democrat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so the, the system basically turned in on itself then because it couldn't actually survive in a democratic state. Mm. Uh, and whenever, like I remember proposing uh, at a meeting that we had, that we, after the Good Friday Agreement, that we take our seats in the uh, Northern Assembly. And I, I've done that on the basis that we had failed in the past because of partition, because of a civil war, and OK, history, you know, there's no point in looking back. But because of those things, there was a danger if we didn't take our seats in Stormont in the US Assembly, that we would fail again. And, and so we have proved that we've been into the Assembly, of taking our seats, of walking our, our way up, and walking with unionism. And part of it was about going in there and walking with unionism, and challenging unionism uh, that has now showed that the process has worked by dialogue, by people sitting down and negotiating and taking positions uh, that, that had to be delivered on. Uh, and so we, we have proved uh, both in the councils by uh, using the DeHaunt mechanism of uh, sharing power with the unionism and with all the parties uh, right across the board. And no matter where we had the majority that we still shared power across the four year term of the councils. And the same in the assembly that we share about. But I, I think, you know, the whole issue of, of uh, you know, the, the British uh, handling of it 
was poor. And even when, whenever they prorogued Stormont 50 years ago, White Law prorogued Stormont and, and done away with the Stormont as a parliament. We now have an assembly, but they did have a parliament. Uh, and once they lost that power, instead of actually reforming themselves and re-looking really at what went wrong, they actually uh, just said, well, not an inch, we won't give way, and we're staying where we are. And, and Pooch's attempt to, to take over the leadership of the DUP was really saying that again, you know, not an inch, and, and we're, we're staying in power, we are the biggest party. But you know, even, the, even the negotiation of the St Andrews Agreement changed the, the, the mechanism within Stormont of how you select the first and deputy first minister. That instead of it being the majority of the unionism and the majority of nationals, they changed it round that it was the largest party uh, because they thought the DUP would always be the largest party, mm. but they're not now. Uh, and so uh, all of that will change. Mm. And I'd like to transition to ask you uh, a bit more about the Kurds again. So first, uh, Sinn Féin um, is a supporter of the Freedom for Ujjalan trade union campaign um, and has been for a number of years now. Um, how do you view the significance of, of Abdullah Ujjalan and, and why do you think that this campaign is important? Well, I think it's important that we do uh, create the inclusive process uh, and a process which everybody takes part in. And one of the measures within the Irish peace process that was very successful was the release of the political prisoners. First of all, recognizing that they are political prisoners, they're only there because of their political level. And also, and the case is similar, it should be released, uh, and, and the prisoners should be released because the prisoners have a great input into the change that can happen. They, they understand it. They've been in prison, you understand what needs to be done. And, and sometimes people see that if you release people, that that will add to the struggle. It adds to it in a very political way. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, Ursula and Aki can play a major part in driving that peace process across, but it must be inclusive. Uh, and one of the things that uh, we have, you know, learned from, we learned it from the South Africans, in relation to their peace process, mm -hmm. and we we implemented it here that we actually had to have everybody involved, uh, right down to the smallest individual independent group in that actually did it. Because if you exclude somebody, you're doing what the British done all over again uh, of isolation and, and trying to discriminate against people. So it's uh, very, very important that we do have uh, that. And you know, they welcome the fact that you've now getting legal visits and, and hopefully those things should never have been denied. Those things should have been a right, you know, and prisoners should be treated properly as well. Uh, so it's all very important and part of it. And one of the things you find is that people become passionate about political struggles because of prisoners and in support of prisoners. So it is very important that we actually remember the role that prisoners can play positively in the future. So hopefully we see the release of all the Kurdish prisoners and, and become part of it. Like the example of Bobby Sands, you know, the, uh, the, the, he went on the hunger strike and, you know, one of the things that they come across was the, the message that he was delivering was a peace message, yeah. even though when he was dying on hunger strike, but exposing the fact that the British government, again, hadn't learned the lessons of the, uh, the civil rights campaign. They couldn't give way to very simple demands you know, the right of a prisoner to wear his own clothes, the right of not to be treated as a criminal uh, and having to do prison work, uh, and the right to associate with other prisoners. The, uh, the, the state couldn't get into those very basic ones because they had the, the idea that this was oppression was the way to put people down. They think they can beat people by oppression, but it, it doesn't work. Uh, and unfortunately, Roy Mason, a Labour MP, unfortunately, was the man who actually imposed the whole issue of the uh, criminality and trying to make prisoners criminals. The, the, the prisoners weren't criminal before they went in, and they certainly British government were never going to label them as criminals. And the same in relation to Kurdish prisoners. They're not criminals. They're working on the political process. They're working on behalf of the people. Uh, so they should be recognized, not actually oppressed in that situation. Absolutely. And so the final, the final question uh, I would like to ask you is, in addition to what you said about 
the necessity for inclusion of all people and all elements of, of society in this process. What are there any other lessons that you think can be drawn from the peace process with the British state in the course of the Irish struggle that you think would be relevant for the Kurdish movement in their struggle to realize the peace process with the Turkish state and the political resolution of the Kurdish question? Well, I think in, in all of the peace processes, mm -hmm. the, um, the dialogue, the engagement, yeah. and discussion, uh, and the inclusivity, as I just said, uh, is key to any peace process that goes on. The, uh, the South Africans found it that whenever they were going in to talk to the white apartheid government, they actually they were saying you're wrong. And and one of the things that, that they were saying to us was, whenever you agreed with them that they were wrong, it's very hard to actually to to kick a dog and start barking at you. Mm. So <laughs> that, uh, yeah. one of the things that the po the process actually meant was that people had to talk with those that they didn't agree with. They had to explain the case. And it's very easy to explain your case to yourself or to your friends. And if you're only talking to the people who support you, but you have to start talking to the people who don't support you. And the, the Kurdish government, they, uh, instead of oppression, they actually should be seeing how they can move to inclusivity uh, and also how they can involve everyone in the dialogue. Because you know, it's like all the different countries that actually got freedom uh, they got it through dialogue, and they got it through. And you know, you know, if if you if you try to keep people out, it's like in, in an armed struggle situation. If people can't get over the through the wall, they'll go over the top of it, or they'll borrow underneath it, or they'll do something. And the peace process is a wee bit the same. That if people have been excluded, people have been kept out, they will find a way to get in. Uh, and the one thing is actually drawing support from the other countries we found. So as I say, the, the South Africans were a key player in getting the dialogue and, and working with people and, and trying to, to deal with the situation that when somebody says, you're wrong, the, uh, it's been big enough to say, well, you're right. Uh, and to me, um, the whole issue of, of dialogue is a key element in our peace process. Every peace process is different. But the key element is actually bringing the people that you need into the room, not excluding anyone, bringing them all in, disagreeing and arguing out the case, but actually then finding ways and, and finding supporters outside. We found the United States government uh, were a key player in bringing everyone together within, you because, uh, OK, America is different in relation to Ireland, and, and there are many difficulties with America. Uh, but one of the things that, that they actually were, because they, were, they could bring together the Irish government, the Irish nationalists, and, and unionism knew that they were an important player. The British government knew they were an important player for trade deals in the future. So they were very respected. And the Clinton, we were lucky to have Clinton as president at the time and been able to get them to facilitate the negotiations mm -hmm. and to come together to bring about the Good Friday Agreement. And, that was, a, that was a key agreement in, in actually how the, the process moved forward. There are many difficulties with it and uh, in, in how you implement it and how you work it, but it was still a key agreement and the British government you know, need to be careful not to walk away from it because it is the one successful agreement that Tony Blair negotiated. He had many difficulties after it, but uh, it was the one successful negotiation that he did have uh, and it is the legacy that he left behind in the in the negotiated peace process. I think that's such a such a powerful message, the the centrality and importance of dialogue. And I think that that's a great place to close. Thank you so much for speaking with us, Francie. Are there any final okay. thoughts you would like to leave us with in closing? No, I, I think just to, to wish you all good luck because you no, know, it, it is hard struggles and at times in our struggle, and particularly when you were following coffins to graves, uh, at times it looked there was no uh, light at the end of the tunnel. And then the peace process showed that there was a way forward. And the fact that the world come in behind it uh, and the European Union come in behind it, all of that was there. So hopefully uh, keep up the, the momentum, keep up the pressure. And the main thing is 
trying to create the dialogue for the future. Absolutely. And your and your support means very much to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.